Welcome everyone to Slow Art Friday. My name is Paige Taylor. I'm the Learning and Engagement Assistant here at the Asheville Art Museum. And I'm joined today by Megan Pyle, our touring docent. Uh, just a reminder, uh, microphones and video is muted by default. And in a moment, uh, we welcome you to unmute yourselves as uh, Megan will begin our conversation. Um, <clears throat> just a reminder to choose a quiet room and silent all devices. Try not to sit in front of a window or other strong light source. Use headphones and microphone for best sound quality. And use a desktop, laptop, or tablet for the best viewing experience. And make sure that your uh, name includes, uh, or your video includes your first and last name, or first name and last initial. Um, in a moment, um, we'll ask you to unmute your microphone uh, when Megan um, begins our discussion. Um, you can also type your questions and comments into the chat box. Um, you can raise your hand or use the, um, the Zoom raise hand option. And just a reminder that we're recording. So if you prefer not to be recorded, you're welcome to turn your video and audio off and enter your questions and comments in the chat box. Each Friday at 12 p.m., docents lead virtual interactive conversations about a few artworks in our collection or special exhibitions. The goal is simple, slow down, discover the joy of looking at art and talk about the experience with others. For today's program, Megan will lead us in an interactive conversation about three artworks in our collection. We'll spend about 15 minutes or so with each artwork. Megan will allow us time to look at each artwork on our own slowly before leading a conversation about each one with questions. As participants, we encourage you to engage with Megan, myself, and each other throughout the hour. Are there any questions? Okay, Megan, what are we going to be talking about today? Well, good morning um, uh, or good afternoon. Uh, yes, my name is Megan Pyle. I'm happy to be with you all this afternoon and share a conversation about these artworks. Um, in honor of a woman's point of view, I've chosen three artworks whose subjects um, are sometimes associated with women, uh, romantic landscape, the moon, uh, and, a, and a teapot. So I'm very curious as to what your point of view will be um, regarding these artworks. If, um, if, you will, if you also associate these subject matters with women, um, and also all of the artists today are women, so, um, well, let's, let's just get started. Um, Paige, may we see the first artwork, please? Okay, so let's take a few seconds to um, look at this artwork, uh, top to bottom, side to side, corner to corner. So where is your eye drawn first in this artwork? I sort of drawn to the green the, of the mountains or the hills or the trees, the rolling kind of of the green trees, yes, along there. And I kind of sort of see this picture as being soft and dreamy, but I, and I think that's due to the brush strokes and the colors. Okay, good. So, um, and soft and dreamy, um, and the brush strokes and the colors. Um, so, um, I, I think also in the, in the background, it kind of fades, you know, like, well, of course that's in the distance, but the colors get real soft and fuzzy, almost like maybe there's a, a fog or, um, I, I love the way it looks. I, I like the way the uh, mountains are done. 
Okay, good. Well, I do too. Uh, I think this is wonderful painting. It's, it's actually relaxing and restful to me, but I'm noticing that going from the bottom left-hand corner is almost like a backward C that follows the hedges up around to the top left-hand corner. And uh, I really like that. It pulls your eye right into the painting and up to those mountains. And uh, that is especially nice, I think. Okay, good. I agree with, uh, uh, was it Sharon? Uh, my yes. eyes are really drawn um, back into the frame, um, partially from um, that sort of backward C line that Sharon was describing, but also I kind of bounce back and forth through these houses into the distance as well. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. I think the fact that there's no people or animals or anything like that just gives you this mm -hmm. sense of serenity out there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I okay. was kind of thinking there's a white figure like in the on the right hand corner, like on one of the first hills that I thought might be an animal, but I'm not sure. Maybe it's something. Where is that, Barbara? I, I think um, it's like if you go straight up from the first house roof on this top hill there. Yeah. Yeah. There. yeah. I was thinking mm. that might be an animal. Could be. Grazing um, mm -hmm. a horse. I, or yeah. Okay. I'm muted, right? Yeah. Does it look like an animal to anybody else? Definitely something there. It's hard to discern looks a little bit a little bit like a roof to me but the oh, maybe. the brush mm -hmm. are very loose so i think that it is kind of open to interpretation i, think I love the many ecosystems i see starting with the marsh in the foreground and then the meadow and the pond and um, going all the way up to the heavy wooded uh, hills um, I, she covered a whole lot in this beautiful painting. Okay, good. I think the color of the frame also really brings out the, the picture, the, this gold and then the little dark um, pieces of the dark go in the gold there just really accentuate the, uh, the, the picture. Yeah. Okay, good. So um, what about um, the, the texture of this, of this artwork? Because some of you have described it as being soft and dreamy. Um, but uh, how, um, how thick do you think the paint is on this canvas if we were looking at it in the museum? Hmm. Do we want to see a section of it a little close up to get an yeah. idea? Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's see. Maybe it almost looks like it could be watercolor because the, the way it, the colors kind of blend and um, they're so soft. <laughs> Okay, good. It looks three-dimensional. Oh. Yeah, the little white white place is a roof. You're right. Oh, it is. It's mm -hmm. a little yeah. door. That's a little house, house there. there. Yeah. Mm. Okay, good. So, um, what what do you think um, about the the mood of this painting? Hmm. What kind of emotions does it evoke in with you? I say peaceful. Mm -hmm. I would like to know from the artist, um, the inspiration, if this is something like real, is this a scene that the artist, mm -hmm. you know, put the easel out and painted, or is it a compilation of things she's seen in her lifetime? Okay. It, it sort of suggests to me a, uh, to comment on what Laurel just said, a sense of remembrance and a tranquil time. And, and it's definitely, for me anyway, kind of calming. And uh, I guess you could say chill out when you look at this. 
<laughs> okay, good. So, um, so it's a simpler time. So, mm -hmm. so what time period do you think this painting is set? In the, in the right hand corner by the large barn is a green little, it's that's a tractor of some sort. So I think within, would be within my generation, I'm just saying it would be not way, way back, but maybe, you know, 50, something like that. Okay. Is Good. what I'm thinking, yeah. Do you see any other um, signs of modernity or? Hmm. I don't see any uh, telephone poles or things yeah. like that, which would indicate, mm. <clears throat> you know, wires coming in and all. But to me, too, it just kind of looks like a hot summer's day. Everybody's inside at noontime and, you know, just uh, it really looks very warm. Maybe that's why people are not out kind of at noontime. You go back in the house and take a little rest till the sun gets a little further down. Okay, good. Although I would like to just take a chair and a cool drink and just sit. There. <laughs> <laughs> sit well, sit in the shade, Laurel. <laughs> okay, good. Oh, good. So yeah. what, what message do you think the artist is trying to convey? Mm. Slow down, you move too fast, you know. <laughs> mm. Appreciate the beauty of your home or appreciate the mm -hmm. beauty of... Uh, the mountains and well she's paid a lot of attention to the uh the mountains and the trees with the shading and with the marsh and the ecosystems as someone mentioned earlier the little touch of water it's it's um it certainly is a tribute to the beauty of nature to me it feels uh like mm -hmm. she's sharing her love of nature in this painting okay good Kind of like slow down, stop, take a look around. Mm -hmm. And today's Arbor Day, so you can see. Um, oh, there you go. Oh, wow. Well, I think uh, two other things strike me now as I sit and look at it. I really like how the artist was able to do uh, mostly a, f a flat ground towards the buildings and then gradually going up on the side fields that show a different plane. So she's working on a lot of different planes and then of course finally coming to the mountains which pop up in the back. So we have that, uh, those differences, I won't call them contrasts, but just differences. But then there is the nice contrast where she's really darkened those bushes in the back that are large and obviously supposed to be, I don't know, a, a lot of foliage there, a kind of foresty, whatever, and contrasting that to the lighter fields that are in front of it and all of that is very nice and but just a very simple contrast of things that um, help it to be more interesting i think if this was all just flat it wouldn't be as interesting as it is to us but this is excuse me i fell down <laughs> oh no oh, oh well, no 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 uh oh now i'm all oh dear come back sharon i'm trying to Ah, uh, there it is. Oh, good. Okay. Okay. Enough said. <laughs> but I also see like the division of different, um, uh, maybe different fields, because in the in the foreground uh, after the march of the water, it could be different crops because each of these are kind of demarked by a different coloration, so they could be had something else growing. Okay, good. One thing too, those the trees and or the bushes in the background are casting shadows and it's all of a sudden it's just reminding me no matter how bright and hap, bright and tranquil, there's always a shadow side and a, a darker side. And maybe she's just contrasting how um, how, re how relevant each nature is to teaching us about our nature. Okay, good. Okay, good. So I see Peter in the chat box says it could be Western North Carolina. Mm -hmm. um, so does anyone recognize this? Um, hmm. 
or has anyone been, you know, been for a drive out in the country and, and seen a, viewed a similar scene? Yes, I was even thinking that. Um, I like to do, uh, do road trips and uh, it reminds me of uh, beautiful uh, landscapes that pass by your window when you're driving through the roads and in the back roads in um, North Carolina and Virginia. It reminds mm -hmm. me of that. Okay, good. So is there anything about this artwork that you would associate with a woman's point of view? No, not necessarily, I don't think. Mm -hmm. So what makes you say that? Well, I think this could be done by a man or woman. It would just be a, a pastoral a landscape. So. Okay, good. So the, um, and you all have described some of the emotions that you've felt um, soft, dreamy, peaceful, relaxing, serene. Um, mm -hmm. Are those sort of things that you would associate feminine or masculine or sort of neutral? Well, I think the words that we used were are more feminine words, but I I, you know, we've seen so many painters in the 1800s and 1900s that uh, are men who do uh, scenes like this as well. And I, I, I don't know, perhaps I just would disagree. I think it's either man, female or male. Okay, okay, good. Yeah. So um, the, and how about the, the color choices. Mm. I think. Um, what about the color choices? Is there anything we can discern as feminine about the color choices? There's kind of a nice balance of soft greens and bold greens. Yeah. Or sort of softer colors and, and stronger colors, which kind of I feel gives it a nice balance, um, compositional balance. Okay, good. Right. I think she wanted to be accurate pretty much is what you were seeing. She was um, maybe being conscious of depicting it as it really is. Cause you don't, I don't get any sense of any abstraction here or um, artistic liberty by painting a tree yellow, uh, I mean, pink or something. So I think she was uh, conscientious in uh, painting what we were, what she was seeing or, or what was to be seen. Okay, good. Well, I, I did have a question though, Megan, about the colors in the foreground are kind of uh, orangey and yellow, which would probably make me think of fall, but then the rest of it feels very, um, summary like well maybe it's late mm -hmm. late uh summer august uh, mm -hmm. and some of the because the big the forward part is uh, more of an orangey mm -hmm. kind of color a salmon kind yep. of color, which can be called more feminine but i don't know whether it's reflecting the time of the year or just mm -hmm. a, a dissolve well it also is picked up in the roofs of the uh, of the four of the three of the houses in the front mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. okay good well i know it could be that the flowers in the foreground have have bloomed and then now they've you know they've turned brown or kind of an orangey color um it could be a um I know my garden right now is a mix of kind of new things seemingly blooming every couple of weeks and then the kind of the other things sort of starting to go dormant um, that bloomed earlier. But that's a good observation. Okay, okay, well, thank you. Well, um, um, if there are no more questions or comments, um, may we see the label please, Paige? So this is called A Simpler Time, um, and the artist is Linda Cheek, 
um, and it's an oil um, mm -hmm. panel. Um, and mm -hmm. so, uh, but Linda Cheek um, received her formal ed art education from the Ringling School of Art in Sarasota, mm -hmm. Florida. Mm -hmm. uh, and she's got a background in illustration and fine arts. But then in 1990, she built her plein air studio and is now a dedicated plein air painter in the Western North Carolina mountains. So um, I think it's, it's very likely that she did paint this um, just with her easel out in the field. Um, you can see that, that maybe that's the blurriness and the haziness, you know, giving it that plein air. Mm -hmm. um, anyway. But um, she says whenever possible, she likes to paint plein air on the spot because she feels the mood of the place and her reaction to the surroundings is of vital importance to the production of a good painting. Mm -hmm. So I think we've all, that all is, we've all, that's all resonated with us mm -hmm. um, given our reactions. Um, and, um, so she's got a, the artist has a quote from her grandmother that says, I started building my art studio in 1990 and it has been and still is a work in progress to quote my grandma cheek, by the time you've made it, you've had it. Well, may we see the next artwork please Paige? Okay, great. Oh. All right, this one is not relaxed. I don't feel relaxed. <laughs> well, <laughs> thank, thank you, Megan. <laughs> You've just jarred us awake. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well. I, I was just going to say, it's very jarring. So, um, okay. and all that, those pointy... Uh, I don't know, and it feels rather uh, mili either militaristic or, or like some sort of weaponry is what I'm feeling when I'm look mm. looking at that. Okay. Yeah. okay. It would not be in my living room. It would not be in your living room. Okay. I find it intriguing that you could take three colors, the black, the blue, mm -hmm. the white, and take basically uh -huh. maybe like three shapes, the round one, the, the rectangles, squares, and the pointed ones and configurate it that way, mm -hmm. you know, I find that intriguing. Mm -hmm. I agree, Laurel, it's kind of amazing what is produced with, with just mm -hmm. basic, three basic colors mm -hmm. and basic shapes. Yeah. It has a masculine feel to me, and we know now, we know ahead of time it's feminine, but to me it also has a very masculine feel to it, more than a feminine feel, but. Yeah. Okay, good. So what's one word we've heard jarring, pointy, militaristic. What's, what's one word that, um, that you would use to describe this artwork? Mm. Ooh, I like piercing. Because mm. it feels like the circular objects are being pierced. Right. Strong. Okay. I like strong. I agree mm. with that. Okay. Well, maybe because Start. of the maybe because of the recent uh, flights that we've been having to outer space. I'm thinking if you're the wife of an astronaut, maybe this would be kind of. I don't know. I'm looking at the two circles, like the moon and the sun, and uh, you know the swerve that's obviously pointing towards going up and out. I don't know the only I'm trying to make an association that that you might have with this. Okay, good. You know, it reminds me, remember in elementary school when you had to weave papers and make the placemat? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Those are fun. Yeah. It reminds me of that. Okay, good. So the weaving, um, that could be a feminine influence if we think of weaving mm -hmm. and textiles as being sort of a feminine art art form. Um, what um, 
So what else about, what about this artwork? Because we know it's a woman artist. Um, can we try to um, make some associations with femininity or hmm. a woman's point of view? Hmm. I see the saber sword, so it's hard for me to think woman. Okay, okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I see motion, you know, almost like maybe mm -hmm. that's the moon and the earth and the atmosphere and uh, the axis and outer space and things moving yeah. the way those yeah. go like that. <clears throat> it could be a stretch, but, you know, a woman's always juggling things, you know, whether it's home or work or kids or parents or, or you know, whatever you're doing. And there's all these things that you have to, uh, you have to take care of. I don't know. Okay. I see kind of thrusting in because there's some constancy in these, the way the blue is patterned and the white is patterned. Uh, I'm just going to, if I had to title it, I would call it anger management. Because okay. she's, she's concise. She's, she, there's a pattern here rather than, uh, even though it's uh, an abstract, but there's definitely a patterning to it. So gaining control or having control. Okay. Actually, when I was looking, I have to agree with you because actually when I was looking, I was going, wow, this would be a good work for uh, more than math uh, a, a tour because of the patterns in it. And mm. it because there are many patterns. I mean, there are um, deviations from the patterns, but the patterns, I don't know if that's particularly feminine or mm -hmm. um, women tend to be more orderly, so maybe mm -hmm. they the way in a pattern or um, arrange things in patterns. Yeah. Okay, good. Well, I have to say, I, I don't mind this. I mean, I, I don't think I'd want it in my house, but I don't mind it. I think it is a, a nice looking piece. Um, the other thing I was trying to make of it besides being outer space is uh, like ships at sea. Mm. Where, you know, looking up at the moon and, mm. and um, mm. I, I don't know, I guess it's just the shape of the four uh, pieces on the bottom mm. that are going side to side. Okay, oh, good. No. Oh, mm. I'm sorry. I, I was also, thinking about, you know, like, because um, I just recently saw the job, the woman descending the steps, that maybe it's different phases of the moon as it goes into the, into the sky. Maybe that. Just Seeing some motion. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> the, or the, you know, the, the movement of the moon across the sky. Mm -hmm. Pattern and the pattern yeah. of the moon. But it definitely suggests movement to me. Uh, you were mentioning that several times, so maybe okay, a little fancy. Okay. It so, feels organized. It doesn't feel haphazard. Mm -hmm. like, although it's abstract, it's it's deliberate and and organized. So. Okay. Right. Okay. Well. Um, I'll just uh, tell you a little bit about this. Um, there's something called the Apollo's artistic effect. And before the Apollo space program, oh. artistic representations um, were generally more romanticized, whereas after uh, they tended to focus on lunar exploration and were informed by scientific understanding of the moon, its surface, and behavior. Um, so would you characterize this representation um, as more romantic or more scientific, and why? I don't find it romantic. Like, there's no, like, glowiness, if you no. will. You know, I mean, I find it more geometric, scientific, precise, mm -hmm. um, mathematical, um, as opposed to um, yeah. the man in the moon or glowy mm -hmm. cheese or anything like that, you know. Okay. I was going to say romantic, but yeah. almost for the same reasons, though. 
um, because it's because it's abstract and these lines seem I mean they are kind of I mean we have circles that are geometric but these other sort of slices seem a little more organic and loose and, and curved um, and because it's not realistic then it makes me think less scientific Mm -hmm. hmm. Okay, good. When I say realistic, I mean representational. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. I, uh, and I, I kind of see what you what you're saying, Paige, but it just it could be, you know, like when I said the thing about the moonlight and just the shifting and the change of the moonlight could be a more romantic um, aspect of it. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. Um, so what about this? Um, do you think that this, this artist, the artist created this sort of from memory or, or just, you know, just in the studio, just thinking about, about the moon? Or do you think the artist maybe was looking out at the moon um, when this artwork was Creating. Hmm. Well, I just had a new idea. I, th I think it's I think it's uh, in Venice, and the gondolas are all lined up. Oh yeah. So you're looking at the uh, moon uh, from your gondola. But anyway, I I don't think that this had to be done on plein air. <laughs> just. It's uh, to me, it's more of a design. So just in a studio would be appropriate. Yeah, or more like a concept of what the moon is, or I mean, since yeah. with space travel or a concept of, of space travel. Yeah. And then, you mm -hmm. know, representational. Okay, good. So, um, do any of you have a relationship or story about the moon? Do any of you relate relate to the moon, first of all? And then second of all, how does that, um, how do you think the artist's relationship with the moon was depicted in her artwork? Oh, see, what to me is, 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 is suggesting in her terms, maybe, of some kind of conquering of the moon or piercing through it or it, it's celebratory of the moon landings because we've we were able to get there okay good it kind of reminds me of last weekend at my parents house <laughs> um who live in the country with no artificial lights around and last weekend was like a pink moon or something like that it was an extra bright moon and I remember at night um, the moon was so bright that it was caught it was making these um, um, shadows through the Venetian blinds on the wall inside mm. and it was so odd to see shadows at night um, mm. you know with, with no lights so I look at these sort of strips of moonlight as like the 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 pink moonlight coming in through the Venetian blinds in the bedroom. Yeah, that's a good one. <laughs> mm, okay, good. There is there's could be two moons and when there's two moons in the same month, it's called a blue moon. And like that's where the term once in a blue moon comes about. You don't always get two full moons in any given month. And Yes, last month was the, a super um, pink moon. Like each moon every month is named after something. And it's related yeah. to years ago, whether it was farming or what, what the weather was like at that mm -hmm. time and why the moon gets named that way. But I can see one sort right. of moon here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then the use of the blue color for the two moons. Yeah, that's good. Yeah. Uh, last weekend, I was up at a lake. Um, and the moon was so beautiful. I do think of the moon as so white because I live in Montana. And this, then I thought, oh, this is so unromantic. There's no ripples. There's no shimmering. But uh, 
it is an abstraction and I love blind uh, image. So I think it's fascinating how we're describing it. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. Okay, good. So, um, and what about um, just, do you think there's a connection between um, the phases of the moon and mm -hmm. like a woman's fertility cycle? Mm -hmm. is, mm -hmm. is mm -hmm. Contemplated that? Okay. Now. <laughs> yeah. Oh. It could be some Freudian phallic um, mm. <laughs> in this picture as well. Mm -hmm. We're going there, but I don't know. Okay. Again, well, so it sounds like there's a lot of, there's a lot more than meets the eye um, in terms of interpretation of this artwork and and we could probably go in lots of different lots of different directions i i just want to add to what megan is uh, megan rather is saying uh i because there's two schools of thought some people title their artwork up beyond like opus 25 or something or untitled work but if it's titled, your imagination starts often going in that direction versus the untitled. So I'm really interested now to see what the title of this will be and where it might lead us. And I'll be upset if it's Opus 27 or something. <laughs> okay. Well, I'll tell you the title is um, the title is Moonlight, mm. which to me is a romantic title. Do you want to go to that slide or not yet? Uh, yes, please. Thank you. Yeah. So um, this is a, a screen print on paper, and it was um, it's circa 1965, so it was before the moon landing, Ooh. but um, but during the the space race. Mm -hmm. um, but but upon hearing the title Moonlight. Does that evoke, like for me, it sort of evoked a, a more sort of romantic point of view of this, this artwork. Um, okay. But I don't know, does it change anyone else's um, perceptions of this, the title? Does is it satisfy? No, it's, I mean, the title now focuses in on... Um, uh, yeah, it, it is more focused, and I'm wondering, because this also senses so much motion, if they're not trying to depict who's first to get there, because if the top guy or the top figure is there, and then the others are still trying, and another one's there, so it, it senses, it seems to have that element to me now with that title. Oh, okay. Close to the moon because they're all motioning and they're going in, the, in an upward direction. Hmm. Okay, good. Wow, that's interesting. Well, the artist, um, Helen Gerardia, um, was born in Russia in mm -hmm. 1903, but then she um, immigrated to the United States and, um, and lived in New York where she died in 1988. Um, her artwork is included in the Smithsonian American Art Museum collection, and she's known for her hard edge abstractions and graphics, but she was primarily a painter and participated in the abstractionist, abstract expressionist movement early in her career. Um, but then she sort of, in the 1950s, she leaned towards the Cubism movement and she used geometric shapes in much of her artwork um, and used the colors black and white primarily. Mm. But she started incorporating more color in her artwork in 1959, uh, including lavender, which is not shown here, but which renders heavily into her works in the early 1960s. She emphasized negative space frequently in her work. Um, which was featured prominently due to her use of color. But in 
But like other artists of her time, she was influenced by the, you know, exploration of outer space. And as a subject, the moon, its phases, light, and celestial movement came up frequently in her paintings mm. in prints in the middle of the 20th century. And having immigrated uh, to America from Russia in the late 1940s, um, perhaps the so-called space race uh, was of particular interest to her. Mm. So, uh, well, may we see the next artwork, please? Oh. Thank you. So we'll take um, a few few seconds to look at this top to bottom, corner to corner, side to side. So what's going on in this artwork? What's the, the first word that comes to mind? Well, I have a question first. Is okay. this a painting or is this a, uh, a ceramic? It's a, it's a ceramic. It is a ceramic. So yes. it isn't a actual uh, teapot, if we will. Um, yes. Okay. Yes. Mm-hmm. I want to. I can see where the lid would come off. It looks like a line there. So I don't know if it could be a functional teapot. Yep. All right. And then I'm also drawn to the pink color down at the bottom. Like, yes, mm -hmm. that's very interesting to me. Mm -hmm. Okay. Good. Mm -hmm. It has like an alligator feel to me. That scaly. Yeah that they have there that's okay, interesting. Good. There's sort of crackle, mm -hmm. uh, I think it's called a lichen glaze, is that? Oh, okay. My parent, I think that sort of crackle effect. Mm -hmm. um, it looks fragile, I mean, because of that crackle effect, it almost looks like if I touched it, it would just like disintegrate. You know? Okay, good. I think it's absolutely beautiful. Uh, and I would love to put it on a shelf in my house somewhere because I think mm -hmm. it's really, really interesting. The textures, the way that the handle is twisted, the way the top is twisted, the mm -hmm. elegance of the spout. It's just such a beautiful thing, but I, I don't think it's functional at all. I mean, I don't know whether it is. Megan, do you know if it is functional? Um, I do not know that if it is functional. Well, if it isn't functional, then I think maybe it's saying, we have tea bags now, we don't need you, Paul. <laughs> uh oh, wait a minute. <laughs> well, as a person who I have a teapot and teacups, mostly antique, but I also have some modern, um, and I have probably 15 teapots and 35 teacups and saucers. Um, this looks to me like it's very functional uh, and I would put it more on display than actually using it because I do use my collection because I drink tea all day. But this spout, the spout is very, very skinny, which would not allow a lot of water to come out maybe to um, actually be refreshing your teacup. But it's, it's, again, I agree with Barbara, it's very, very pretty and would be beautiful on a shelf. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. I think the shades of blue are very, very nice, you know, mm -hmm. the shading on that. And again, the shape where Barbara pointed out that the curves of the top and the handle and the, the pouring spout. And then mm -hmm. the body of the teapot, it, it's an unusual shape. It's not perfectly round or perfectly oval or tall or slender. And it, so it's got this sort of yeah, usual texture shape to it, like a, a free free form. Yeah. yeah, I agree. I find the texture the most uh, intriguing or most alluring part of the um, object um, with that with that crackle. But also, I think um, Barbara mentioned like the twisting um, shapes as well. It's really cool together to see those textures and those that sort of mm -hmm. movement in the clay. 
it's just it's clay. Kind of, it's just the kind of thing that you can just feel, keep looking at. Um, it just uh, always one thing draws you to another. As you look at the crack along the top, you're drawn to the lines of the curve. It's it's uh, optically appealing. It's very very beautiful. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. So, um, so what do you think was the artist's intent in creating this artwork? What? Um, okay. She's demonstrating three different techniques there with the spout or the, the funnel and the top and then the crackle and then the, the looks like the handle uh, is a different kind of technique. Okay, good. So it's she's showing the artist is showing a lot of technical expertise. Mm -hmm. in this I'd be topic. interested in the size. I know we're going to find that out afterwards, but whether it's like a miniature or, you know, a, mm -hmm. a full size uh, teapot. So if you were in a in the art in the art gallery or um, or in a shop, and you saw this teapot, um, would you know that it was created by a woman? Um, when well, I, I, don't think you, I don't think you could ever one hundred percent know that. However, it is uh, it just has some very pleasing lines and curves to it and whatever. So it does look a little more feminine, but certainly a man could have created it. I saw Sandy, you were shaking your head no earlier. Well, when I looked at it yesterday, I, I kind of thought we had a moon theme, though I know that was last week. I had pictured an astronaut on the moon with his round globe and walking and I just thought that was the texture of rocks on the moon. Okay. <laughs> and so I thought the blue color was very fitting against the white and the black. But today he doesn't look like an astronaut. He looks like Winnie the Pooh. <laughs> okay. Can we tell, is it signed on the bottom right? Is that words? If you zoom in on the bottom right there, is that a signature or just... Mm. Is this where you mm. wanted to look for? Yeah, that's what I wanted to look for. Mm. It's hard to tell that this was almost like a signature there. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Mm. It's kind of a nice uh, close-up of the texture. Mm -hmm. yeah. I think it's just a, an artist experimenting with texture and feeling. It's just, it's almost like a abstract expressionist teapot. <laughs> yeah. A very, you know, it looks like a one of a kind. Like it doesn't look like something mass produced or, you know, I mean, it'd be nice to see little plates or teacups to complement or match it, but definitely a one of a kind. Like a, a fine art version of an everyday object. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yes, that's right. Okay, good. So, um, so why do you think, um, this is in an art museum. This it wouldn't be in a tea shop. <laughs> yeah, I'm just kidding. Uh, I, because it's beautiful, but I was saying, you know, the artist it's created give an impression of a teapot, but it's not right. really a useful teapot. I, I, you say it's functional, but even if I had it and it was a teapot, I would never, never, never use it because. Well, I know we're all calling it a teapot, but actually to me, it's a sculpture. Yeah. Mm. Sculpture. It's teapot-like. Teapot-like sculpture. There we go. There you go. Okay. That's good. I think it's art because of the creative um, yeah. multiple techniques of um ceramic or the glazing or all of those things put together that make it mm -hmm. look the way it does. Mm -hmm. I definitely think there's a focus, an artist, the artist is focused on the objectness of it as one might with the sculpture more than the functionality, not that mm -hmm. function necessarily rules something fine art or not. Mm -hmm. Okay. 
And then what if this were a different medium? Like if this were a painting of a teapot, um, would you, it, would, it, would it be art? And would it be sort of worthy of being displayed in an art museum? I could see it if it was part of some sort of theme, ad, theme that they were doing, um, everyday art or something maybe even celebrating tea itself or, or, or something. I, I don't see it as a standalone, if it were a painting. I have a painting of some teapots in my, in my kitchen. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so maybe somebody might like to have a painting of a teapot in their mm -hmm. kitchen. Although this, I don't know, this is so much about the texture. Mm -hmm. um, but then it would be quite um, an homage to the artist to, to uh, be able to create the texture and paint. Okay, good. So, so the standout feature is the texture, it sounds like for you and, and maybe some other comments that we've heard. Um, so what if this were a different color? Um, if this were, say, pink, um, can you imagine it and kind of describe how you'd feel looking at it if it were pink? I like pink. I don't know. I think I could probably still <laughs> like it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I might get some cotton candy associations with, with that color and that texture, maybe. And I think it would feminize it a great deal yes. more than the blue is. Yeah. Or suggest feminine. Mm -hmm. I think if that would stay in pastels, it wouldn't change as much. For me, like if it was an iridescent green, I might not particularly care for it as much. I think if it stayed in the pastel, like lavender or pink or very pale shades, I think um, because that's what contrasts so so much with the the crackle, which is seems so hard, and then mm -hmm. the softness of the other colors. Um, so if it was a soft color, I don't think it would change. I think a different color might change the uh, feeling of the artwork. Okay, good. So do you all um, see uh, any imperfections? Or do you think that, it would, that all of these cracks and the pink lines, um, do you think they were all intentional by the artist? I think it was just started to be created and it kind of took her where it took it where it took her as opposed to like writing it out like an architect on a piece of paper and designing every yeah. single little crack and crevice. And I think she just kind of started doing it with a general idea in mind and this is what happened. Yeah. Does the crackle process, I'm not familiar with it and I'm not a potter in any means, but does that crackle process just happen naturally? Or is it intentional by the artist? I mean, during the uh, firing process or whatever? I was just curious if anyone knows. Well, it is intentional by the artist, yes. Right. So each yeah. one of those little squares is intentional or, or forms is intentionally put in there then? Yes. Okay, okay. Right. I don't. I don't think it's that. I think that when they when they paint on the outside finish of it, uh, they know it's going to crackle. But I don't think. I mean, they haven't painted every little tiny piece there. They just know that it'll, the whole the whole area will be crackled. Okay, is my uh, what I think about that. Yeah. Okay. Good. Yeah. They. You can see the kind of the larger crackle areas and then the, the smaller right. areas and yes. Okay. Yeah, that's random. Yeah. Okay. But obviously they put it on. I mean, she, intent she intentionally chose how to do it that way, but the pattern that evolved is just random. Or the, yeah. okay. Right. Right. Oh, good. Well, thank you for that. Yes. Okay.
But another thing that makes me think that this is just orna ornamental mm -hmm. is that uh, the lid or what appears to be where the lid would come off is much too small to really wash out the pot because <laughs> you do need, if you're actually using it, you do need to uh, wash it out. Tea stains the inside of pots mm -hmm. and you have to wash them out. So that would be very difficult with this pot. But like Barbara said, this pot is beautiful just to put on your shelf. So that, that would be fine. Well, that's a very good observation. <laughs> yeah, I hadn't thought of that. Um, well, um, let's, uh, may we see the label, please? Paige? Oh, thank you. So it's aptly teapot. titled Teapot. <laughs> oh. Basia Edelman. Um, and she's a, a Jewish, Jewish woman, um, and she studied with Joseph Albers at Black Mountain College in the oh. summer of 1946, um, and she's very, um, she's very well educated. Um, she had an MFA, and um, but she. Uh, she lived from 1925 to 2009, and she um, says she was fortunate that clay was introduced to her before she attended kindergarten. She had an aunt who was living with her family who had a job at Paul Revere Pottery in Boston, where all the women um, were single who worked there. And they were invited to bring nieces and nephews in on Saturdays. Oh, nice. And there was only one man in the studio. And he was a Sicilian man named Ernesto, who made the forms on the wheel and then fired the kiln with coal. But he <laughs> sometimes would center a ball of clay and lift, um, lift her onto his lap and just let her mess it up. She said she was the youngest Thanks. of all the Saturday visitors. Um, and so, um, and then when she was nine, the same aunt uh, paid her way for Boston Museum classes for children. So she took up painting and drawing. Um, and then she said, clay became a potent influence on my life. Um, and like I said, she had just a very, Fancy education, but she said it took her decades to find her voice stronger. Um, and she she raised three children, and um, and also taught um, at you know, and then had just sort of this illustrious career. Um, and she said. The work had changed periodically as I reached corners and had to reinvent myself to, to emerge from them. She made ritual vessels, teapots, sculpture, textured surfaces in both clay and glaze. Um, and and she, uh, at her, when she died, her obituary said, wear black at your own risk um, because she liked bright colors. <laughs> yeah. Great. Well, thank you all so much for joining us today. Uh, what great conversations we shared and um, just your insightful comments really sparked ideas about these artworks that I had never thought of. So it's always so fascinating. Um, but I'm so glad you joined me and I hope um, to see you at the museum um, and thank you Paige. Thank you Megan and thank you for the selection of artworks that you share with us today and thank you everyone for participating in, uh, in our conversation. Um, we hope that you'll join us again next week on um, Friday May 7th as our docents Sarah Reinke and Steve Bennett will uh, lead us in a discussion with the theme of darkness to light. Um, so hope to see you there and have a wonderful week. Thank you. Bye-bye.